All right, take your Bibles with me to John chapter 7. This morning, we're going to continue in our series through the Gospel of John. I hope you guys have been blessed and challenged through the Gospel of John. This is, of course, personally my favorite book in the Bible. There's so much here. Um, but we're going to pick it up this morning in chapter 7. If you're there in your Bible this morning, say amen. The Bible says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it and that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he went also up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, he is good. He is, and others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Between chapter 6 and here in chapter 7, six or so months have passed. In chapter 6, it was close to the Passover, and now we see that the timing, as mentioned by John, was that they were close to the Feast of the Tabernacles. And so uh, the Passover would be somewhere around what we celebrate Easter, around uh, springtime. And then the Feast of the Tabernacles, which we speak of this morning, would have been closer to harvest time, September, October, in our calendar. And so Jesus had, at this point, seen a drastic decline in those who were following him. His message was, of course, very pointed, very clear, and the people, of course, were not, were not at the point where they would believe him, where they would accept his claim as being God in the flesh. And so for a period of time, the Bible records that Jesus remained in Galilee, in his home region. Now, we learned earlier that Galilee was, of course, looked down upon that region. They were unlearned. They, they, you know, the, the school of that day, the religious teachers of that day, they all resided in Jerusalem. But, and in Galilee, even though there was wealth there because of the being close to the sea and the fisher, uh, a booming fisherman business and fishing business. And, and, but these people were looked on downward by those in Jerusalem. And uh, because they were, in their eyes, ignorant and they would not always observe uh, Christian, uh, their, their, uh, excuse me, their Jude- Judaism the way that they, des- they thought they should. And so Jesus is in this region, and, and as the crowds are declining, he's still there being faithful, ministering. And we see something here in the life of Jesus that I think we should all take note of. There's an ebb and flow in life. There are seasons where it seems to be that everything is just falling into place. And then there are other seasons where it seems like nothing is going right, where the crowds are getting smaller and seemingly uh, God isn't uh, in that season. But I want you to understand something, that God is On the mountaintop, God is in the valley. God is in every season, ebb and flow of our life. And Jesus was well aware of this being God himself. And so for these months, he is there in Galilee. But the reason for him being in Galilee was because he knew there was a a tension. There was opposition that wanted him dead. They wanted him dead, the Jewish leaders. And so I want us to, as we look through chapter 7, these first verses, here, there are three words I want to emphasize that, that always follow Jesus throughout his ministry. And I think uh, they're very, of course, applicable even sometimes in our lives. You see, there was always, the, there was always these three uh, things prevalent in Jesus' ministry. The first was death. The second was disbelief. And the third was debate. These three 
uh, items seemingly followed Jesus wherever he went. I want you to see, first of all, that Jesus was a marked man. He was, he, there was a hit out for Jesus, and he, he was living in the pressure of that. He understood that uh, he could not uh, operate like a normal individual because of what he had done at the, uh, previously uh, in John 5 when he healed that crippled man. Uh, it had put him in the, in the scope of the religious leaders of that day. He had exposed them and their religious system and the futility found in it. He had exposed and he had done something that to them was unforgivable and they wanted his neck because of it. He was a marked man and Jesus lived in that pressure. I want you to understand sometimes in our lives, we're going to live in seasons that seemingly is, is characterized as that of being marked, that of having pressure. If we are going to follow Jesus, he is the example. And if we are to live like he did, we should expect persecution. We should expect opposition. We should expect hostility when we follow Jesus. It is not what we've been pitched, right? I've been saying this over the last several weeks that Christianity is not going to make your life a bed of roses. Often it's quite different. Often your life will become difficult when you come to Christ. Often your family won't want to be near you when you come to Christ. Often you will lose the friends that you seemingly had uh, a close relationship to when you come to Christ. I'll never forget this. When I decided to go to seminary, when I, God began to radically change my life, I mean, I had a close group of friends that we did everything together. Of course, it was all sinful, and we were inseparable. But I remember when God got a hold of my heart, and I started to go back to, to him, and, and then I ended up in the seminary of all places. And I just remember just one by one, those friends stopped calling when I declined the next invite to the, to the next party. Or one by one, those, those people began to fall out of my life and and it wasn't because I was being self-righteous. It wasn't because I was trying to be haughty. I, I still love those men till this day. I still talk to these men uh, till this day. They're still a part of my life. But for a season, I saw quickly a, a exodus out of my life when I began to follow after Jesus. And it hurt. These were people who I had known some since middle school. But I understood that if I were to follow Jesus, and I, I, I very quickly begin to realize if I was going to follow Jesus, there is a price tag to that. There is always a cost attached to following Jesus. And sometimes it is uncomfortable. Sometimes we would not choose uh, what we will have to deal with. And I'm telling you, did you, Jesus, I don't think he wanted to be a marked man. I don't think he desired to have to uh, move in a certain way because people saw his life. I don't think, the, the Bible's very clear when they describe Jesus that he was a man who was acquainted with sorrow. He loved his nation. He loved these people, but yet the religious leaders hated him and wanted to kill him, and, and he lived in that. And many times we would see Jesus look to Jerusalem and weep over the city, weep over the rejection. Their Messiah, who they had been waiting for, had come, and they could not see him for who he was. And I'm telling you, he lived in the sadness of that. And I'm, I want you to understand something this morning that we too have to understand that there is sometimes going to be seasons of sadness when it comes to following Jesus. But we've got to learn how to revel in that opposition. We've got to learn to wear it as a badge of honor, not to say, hey, look at me, but to say, hey, look at him. He's worthy. <laughs> is he worthy this morning? He's worthy. I believe it. I read this quote this week about opposition. Opposition does not mean that we are doing things wrong. Often, it is evidence that we are doing things right. If we allow ourselves to be deterred from doing anything, unless we have complete approval, it is certain that we will never accomplish anything of value. Rather than being discouraged by opposition, we should take comfort in God's faithfulness and keep on doing what's right. It's going to be increasingly hard to do what's right, to, to speak up for the truth, to, to live out our faith in these days. And we must be prepared for the opposition. And I would not be a good teacher. I would not be a, a, a shepherd if I, and, and if I don't prepare us as a church, if I don't prepare my family. And some of you, you need to have these talks with your team. Say, hey, 
If you're going to live the standard, if you're going to live for Jesus, you're, you're going to be ostracized by other teams. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to ridicule you. Some are going to hate you. Some are going to malign you. But you got to count it worthy to please only one. I don't know about you, but I just want to hear these words from Jesus more than anything else. I don't want the applause of man. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Isn't he worthy? Jesus lived in the pressure of life. He, he thrived in it, and he moved with wisdom through it. You see, he stayed in Galilee. He chose to stay there because he was on a different schedule. He, he had a divine, we'll see in a little bit, he was on a divine calendar that was leading him to Calvary. He, he, he knew it was not yet time for him to be apprehended. He knew the will of God. He lived for the will of God, and he moved with wisdom. And I'm telling you, in these days, we too have to move with wisdom in this world. Make no mistake, the spirit of Antichrist is in the world, and he's operating. And, and, and I'm telling you, we've got to have wisdom to foresee ahead down the road the agenda of the enemy because he's coming. I'm so thankful that we're in a place where we're going to hear the truth. We're going to hear, we're going to be able to discuss issues that are every day right now in the culture issues so that we know how to navigate those things. So it's coming right to us. And we, we've been saying this for a few years and, and we're seeing it play out. But we've also got to ask God to, to give us uh, wisdom from the Holy Spirit so that we can navigate it like our Savior was willing and able to navigate it. So death is looming. Jesus is living under the pressure of that. I want you to see it's, it's during the Feast of the Tabernacles that this, this is taking place. And I was studying the Feast of the Tabernacles and this week, and I want to share some things about that feast. It was also called the, the Feast of the Booths, or or tents, and uh, this took place after the holy day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. There was a day, of course, in Israel at that time that the high priest would enter into the most holy part of the temple, the holy of holies, and he would sprinkle blood sacrifice on the mercy seat as, uh, a, as a covering for the sins of the nation. And uh, this was the most holy day of the year. And of course, it was all a picture of Jesus. He would, of course, be the lamb, the sacrifice who would shed his blood. And his blood, of course, would be the atonement for the sin of the world. But this all pictured him. The whole system pictured Jesus. And um, they, they did this every year. And only the high priest was allowed in. We sang about it earlier this morning, how there was a veil between uh, and, and over the Holy of Holies, and only the priest would go in. And when the priest would go into the, the Holy of Holies, they would tie a rope around his ankle because if the priest went in there and there was unconfessed sin in his life, he would drop dead at the holiness of God. Let that sink in this morning. He is holy. When we sing that, I think we just do so, so casually. Moses asked, he said, Lord, I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to show me who you are. He said, you can't see me. You die. But I'll, I'll let you see me walking away. And I'm telling you, when Moses spent those 40 days on the mount with God in his presence, oh, in that cloud of his glory, the Bible is clear that when he came down off that mountain, his face shone bright as the sun just from being in the proximity of God's glory. Oh, we serve a holy Holy God, he's powerful. He's beyond anything we can comprehend. And I'm telling you, we've got to get back to placing him in his rightful position in our hearts. This holy day would come each year. And after the sacrifice was made and the blood was sprinkled, five days later, the celebration of the tabernacles, the festival of tabernacles would begin. And um, it would be a very uh, celebratory type of, uh, of, of festival. It was uh, at the end of harvest season uh, for fruit and grapes and olives and other crops. And it was, it was a very joyous time for the Jews. Now, this picture, this, this uh, tabernacles festival, would, would, would picture when Israel was moving 
in the wilderness when they were living in the, the wilderness for 40 years, wandering for 40 years, and, and uh, how God took care of them. And uh, in the evenings there in Jerusalem, in Jesus' time, they would light up lamps, they would light up torches, and this was a picture of how God led Israel with a pillar of fire, fire through the night while they were in the wilderness. This festival will last seven days, and you know, I think we could take a, something from this culture. I mean, they were intentional to, to have these type of festivals to remember something that God had done. And I'm saying to some families, you know, in here that we should have uh, monuments that we set up or, or times that we celebrate that are centered around Jesus and what he's done in our lives and, and how he's brought us through. And, and we should be very intentional to teach our kids to remember, oftentimes Jesus, uh, God would have his people set up these altars and monuments so that when they would pass by it, they would see the stones or they see the altars and they'd be able to tell their son, hey, this is when God uh, brought us across the Jordan River. This is when he brought us out of slavery. This is when he, he led us in the wilderness and they were very intentional. I think sometimes we just slow down and remember what God has done in our lives and tell our kids and have monuments. Hey, let me show you this picture, son. Uh, this is where I used to be. But let me show you where God has brought me. I mean, we need to have these types of things and to make us remember what God has done. And so they celebrated. They would, they would eat. They would party. They would have a great, joyous time for seven days. And it was during this feast that they had the highest expectation that the Messiah would show up that he would come and, and liberate them from the Romans. And so this is the season in which Jesus is living right now. And so we see next the disbelief uh, factor, the disbelief. I want you to see verse number three. And his brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples may also see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. We see here on display the disbelief of his brothers. Now, Jesus uh, had four brothers, okay? This dispels, of course, the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church of the perpetual virginity of Mary. No, Mary and Joseph came together. They had several children after Jesus. His brother's names were James, Joseph, Jude or Judas, and Simon. And how many guys have brothers in here? How many guys uh, were, have lived in a house where my mom, she grew up, she was one of 12. She had six brothers, five sisters. <laughs> yeah. This is back in the 50s and the 60s. Seems like a different world. You know, everybody looks at our family. You know, if we have five as a huge family. But anyways, um, the reason why I have five kids is because I only had two sisters. I was not blessed enough to have a brother. I was just playing. <laughs> it was torture living between two girls. I had an older sister and a younger sister. And they tortured me. They would gang up on me all the time. They would make fun of me. I mean, just I could tell you story after story of how my sisters made my life miserable. So I said, I'm not going to do that to my children. I'm going to make sure we have, Lord, please help me to have enough so that they can have brothers and sisters. And I'm telling you, it's the same thing. That right now, my sisters, my, my kids are making each other's lives miserable. They were sick the last couple of weeks, and they're in the house. And I'm, I kid you not, and I was sick, and I was getting to witness a lot more than I normally do. And it's just unbelievable how they know how to push each other's buttons. <clears throat> And just egg and egg and egg and egg. And let me tell you, this was no different in Jesus' family. Now, he was perfection, right? They would have seen Jesus' perfection on display his whole life. He was the eldest, and they would have had to live up to the standard, but they would, they, they would have never came close. And, and so the tone here in the, his brother's conversation with Jesus is that of mocking. They're giving Jesus' advice. Imagine that. They're giving God advice. <laughs> They're saying, this is what you need to do. They are mocking Jesus 
in, in essence, they are challenging him to prove his Messiahship. They are saying to him, hey, Jesus, go down. Why are you stuck here in Galilee? They would have witnessed the mass exodus of those following him in the Galilean region. They would have seen the, the next several months play out, and there were not big crowds. There were not any miracles that we see or hear of in Scripture. They would have probably seen uh, just Jesus laying low, and they thought that they had the answer. They thought that they would give him advice. And the first thing that they advised Jesus to do was to position himself. They said, hey, go down like a politician wants to be in, in the right position to, with, with the press and with the, the crowds. And, you know, part of the reason why I know there was funny business in the 2020 election is you would just look at the rallies of the certain individual, right? It'd be 30 people in the crowd. <laughs> but anyways, let me not get off on that. They said, position yourself. Jesus, go down to Judea. That's where all the, the rabbis are. That's where the school of teaching is. That's where the temple is. That's where all the religious activity takes place. And during the feast, it would have been uh, the, the, the city's population would have increased significantly. People making the pilgrimage in to observe the feast. And so they're saying, hey, you need to position yourself on the right platform uh, so that you can get the exposure that you need so that you can build uh, a following. They said, position yourself, Jesus. And then they said to promote yourself, to go there and to do the works that you've been doing. He says, go there and don't, don't work in secret, Jesus. Your disciples need to see you do works. You, you need to be on display. You must promote yourself. You must do what you say you've been doing. Now, they were, they were doubting. They said to him, if you do these things. You see, his brothers, they did not believe on him. They seen his perfection. Maybe they even heard of his miracles or witnessed them, but they at this point had not come to belief. But I want to encourage you this morning. Some of you have family like that who haven't come to believe. Some of you are wives in here this morning. You have an unbelieving husband at home right now, and you're praying for them. Or you have children who are unbelievers. I'm telling you, and you're, and I want to encourage you because later on, uh, within Jesus' brethren, there, there would be two that we know of that came to Christ. James being one of them, he became the pastor at Jerusalem. We read his epistle, uh, his epistle, James, the book of James. And uh, some people argue about this, but some believe that Jude, Jude, the, the, the little book in the New Testament before Revelation was written by his brother, Jude. And, um, and so I'm telling you, uh, there is hope for those in your life who have not yet come to Christ. I want to tell somebody today to keep praying, keep pressing, keep seeking God. I'm telling you, if you got a prodigal who's away right now, keep pressing because God can get a hold of them. God can do what only he can do, and he can touch hearts. I, we can't change hearts, right? But he can, and he did that. The Bible records that after his resurrection that his brothers believed on him. Some of them at least. And so this mocking advice to promote himself, to position himself, to, to gain followers was given by his brethren. And uh, it said, no one who seeks to be known openly does things in private. Now, I want you to understand something. Jesus' mission was not to gain a following. It was not to, to gain personal power or prestige. Jesus had come to seek and to save the lost. He had come with a bigger picture, a bigger purpose, redemption for not just uh, Israel, not just that space and time, uh, that small space and time, the 30 or so years he was on earth, but he was looking at the eternal scope of things. He was fulfilling the purpose for those who had died long before he was physically born on the earth. He was looking to this very moment, this very second today, uh, that he would be the way of salvation for everyone who would come uh, to him. For all of the world, he was looking on a grander scheme. He was looking through the lens of eternity, and I'm afraid that many of us live our lives in the here and now, in the temporal, in the worldly mindsets, and, and, and we don't see things for the eternal part of it. And I'm telling you, this is where his brothers were off. They were not believers. They had a worldly mindset. They lived for the here and now, but Jesus saw into eternity. Let me ask you, do you have an eternal focus? 
It will show in our priorities. It will show in our pocketbook. It will show in our time. I was thinking this this morning. The most valuable thing that we have is time. And wherever we spend that shows what our priority is. I just was convicted about that. Like how many movies, how many Netflix binges have I done and just wasted that time? Jesus, he did not waste time. It was not, he was not outside the will of God when he remained in Galilee at the time. He did not need his brother's insight because they were blind. The world is blind. And what the devil does to a lot of people, a lot of Christians today, is he distracts us. He gets our attention on things that won't matter in 50 years. Then we come to the end of our lives. Before we know it, I'm 36 years old, and it just seemed like the other day I was, I was 16. And I know some of you can say that. Even at a, a, a longer clip of time, and, you know, our lives are what the Bible say, but a vapor. It's here, and then it's gone. So we've got to make the most of the time. That's a lot of us, but that only comes when we have faith and we believe God and we, we don't have disbelief in our heart. When we truly believe that eternity is coming, it will change the way we live today and tomorrow. Jesus' mission was bigger than what they could have comprehended. I want you to see Jesus answer, and he hits this in verse number six. He says, then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. He's on a different time calendar, right? He's on a different timetable. He said, but your time is always ready. He's like, but you, you, you guys, need to, you, you can go whenever you want. It's of no consequence how you move. And he's going to say it to them. He's going to shoot. He's going to be very clear to them. He says, the world cannot hate you, verse 7, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Jesus speaks to his brothers, and he says to them very straightforwardly, You're, when you move, it has little consequences. You are a part of the world. The world does not hate you. You are worldly. You are a part of the system. You, The world doesn't have a problem with you. And I'm going to say this. If we are Christians who are truly following God, the world's going to have a problem with us. But if, if we get along with everybody, if no one ever wants our, our heads, if no one ever comes after us, could it be it's because we're like them? And the devil isn't worried about us? Oh, I read throughout the scripture, anybody who's ever done anything for God had a target on them. Daniel ended up in the lion's den. <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up in the fiery furnace. Oh, I can keep going. I can just, I can name it. You know, Joseph ended up in the pit. He ended up in Potiphar's house. He ended up in prison. I'm telling you, I can keep going. Anyone who has ever done anything for God, they, they were under the opposition of the enemy. The world hated them because they were different. They were not of this world. The world was not worthy of these people. And I'm telling you today, we've gotten so comfortable in America. We, we have no distinction from the world. We live the same type of mentality out in our daily lives. And that's why the world really isn't pushing up against most Christians. That's why most Christians would never end up in hot water today because they're just going along the stream of the world, the way of the world. But Jesus always he's laid it out. If you're going to follow me, the world's going to hate you. But if you, there is no fence sitting when it comes to following Jesus, and I'm afraid that many Christians today, they live their life straddling the fence, one, one foot in the world, one foot following God, half-heartedly serving God, and, and, and really in love with the world. And I'm telling you, Jesus sees right through that. Jesus looked at his brothers and said, you guys are of the world. The world doesn't hate you. You, you. you don't bother them. You don't ruffle them. But I do because I'm different. I testify against the work. I am the light of the world. And he will see it in chapter 8 when he gives the light of the world discourse and he says that he, he explains. 
exposes the evil of the world. He, he shines the light on darkness. And, and he said it earlier in John 3 that men love darkness because of their deeds. They're evil. Uh, but he was the light that came and exposed the religious system and the corruption there. He exposed uh, those who were living in sinful lifestyle. Remember when he met that woman at the well and he said, hey, uh, the one you're with right now isn't your husband. But I'm telling you, he did so uh, because I'm telling you, when you go to the doctor and you get that annual physical, you want the doctor to expose that tumor early, right? You want him to expose that which will cost you maybe your life if not treated. And this is what Jesus was for uh, the spiritual climate of that day. And, and even till this very day, he exposes the corruption, the cancer, the evil, the, the darkness, corruption uh, of the world. And, and this is why the world hates him. Oh, I've seen it. We don't like to be called out. We don't like to be held accountable. This is what Jesus was intrinsically, because of who he was, the world hated him. So Jesus answers his brother, says, I'm different. I'm not operating on your timetable. It is not time for me yet to be glorified. We know that later on, Jesus would make a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He would sit on that donkey that had never been set on. He would ride into Jerusalem while the people threw palm branches at his feet. Oh, he would, he would go in declaring that he was Messiah, but he would soon find himself on a cross, a Roman cross, um, because he knew how fickle the crowds were. He knew, and of course it was his appointment. He, when Jesus was saying, it was not yet my time, what do you think? He, his time was leading to the cross. The cross. He lived on that divine timetable. He said it on, and he, when he was praying in the garden. His time had come. All oh, the humanity of Jesus didn't want to go through the suffering. You know, and one of the reasons why I believe Christianity to be true is the transparency the truth found in the word. And, and if I were writing a story and I was the hero of it, I would not reveal any type of moment of maybe some may perceive, I don't think it's Jesus was not weak, but of weakness or seemingly wanting to avoid something. Well, Jesus, he asked the father, he says, if, is there any other way? Can you remove this cup from me? But he said this, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I'm telling you, Jesus was 100% man, but he was 100% God, so he felt every pain of the cross. He felt every whip of that nine tails. He, he felt the nails go through he felt the crown of thorns. He felt the sword in his side. He, and more, more than the physical side of this, he felt the spiritual weight of bearing the sin of the world in his body. Every vile sin you could think about, Jesus bore in himself on that cross. And this is what he said. I'm, it's not my time yet. I'm on a different time schedule than you. Your movement has no consequences, little consequence, but mine, the whole eternity hinges on it. Jesus is the door. Remember, we're going to see it later. He's the door. And all of eternity hinges on him and him alone. He is the way. So Jesus, he answers his brothers very clearly in their disbelief. He says, the world doesn't hate you because you're part of it, but it hates me. So we see Jesus, this doesn't seem to be encouraging. Jesus is facing death. <laughs> he's, he's unbel he, there's unbelievers all around him. His brothers disbelieve him. I mean, it, just, it seems to be he is living uh, in what seemingly is a, a low time. But I want you to see it continues. I want you to see the third word, the bait, centers or follows around Jesus, and it's still the case today. There's much debate 
about who Jesus is, his character, what he has done and who he was. I want you to see. So the Bible says, verse number nine, when he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. So Jesus stays back for a while. Remember the feast is seven days. Then verse number 10, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So Jesus goes up to the feast in secret. He, he, he's, in this, he's either, you know, not around crowds or he's covering his, his head. He's just, he's, he's incognito. He's there, but he's doing so, he's moving secretly. And the Bible says this, that the, then the Jews sought him at the feast. And said, where is he? So the Jews are seeking him. They're looking for him. They, were, they expected to see the new up-and-coming rabbi, teacher there, the, the, the miracle worker, the healer, to be present at the Feast of Tabernacles. And it would have been his duty as the firstborn, as a Jewish male, uh, to stroll up to this type of event, this feast. And so they were looking for him. And when they didn't find him, they, they began to complain. They began to to grumble about him not being there among the people. And so we see this. We see this often within the Israelites. They were a complaining type culture. They always were grumbling. You know, when they're in the wilderness, they grumbled. Uh, you know, when they're in Israel, they grumbled. I mean, I'm telling you, they were grumblers. And let, it, let that not be said of us that we're grumblers. Do we have some grumblers in here? I could be that very quickly. I can, I'm the type of person I can walk in a room and there'll be nine things right. I see the one thing wrong. Any other men like that? Women? Yeah. Okay. You guys have all arrived. These people are grumbling. And the reason they're grumbling because Jesus absence him. No, he isn't publicly out there. And so they, they, they grumble. And then we see a growing division. You see, they begin to complain. And then this was the topic of their their discussions, their, their division between the people. They're, the Bible says that some said that he is good, that he is good. And I want to just park it there for a minute. Um, Jesus is more than good. He's God, right? So this was even a, uh, a less than applicable description of Jesus. There are some who thought he was good. I think that these people who thought they were good were those who were not influenced by the religious leaders, the Jews. So when we see the, the name of the Jews mentioned in this chapter, it's speaking of the establishment, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, these two were always at odds. The fad, uh, that's not a good, that didn't come out right. The Sadducees and the Pharisees were always at odds. They were always speaking. Uh, they, there was one group who were, were liberal, and there's one who were the conservative. The Pharisees would have been the ones. The Sadducees didn't believe in the, the resurrection and other things, and so they were always at odds against one another, but they had, one thing they had in common was that they both hated Jesus. They both had it out for Jesus, and so they made it very known what they thought about Jesus, and so they were influencing the people. Many of the people did not believe Jesus was who he said he was, but there were some who weren't influenced by them that believed that he was good. And then, so we have this crowd, the, the people who believe he's good. And then we have the other crowd. The, they say, no, on the other contrary, he deceives people. There are people who believe that Jesus was deceiving the people, that he was deceptive. And, and I want you to understand something. The way that Jesus presented himself, the way that he operated and the, the miracles and all that he said about himself, his identity, it, it, it always pushed towards a decision, and either he was God or he was not. Either he was who, the Messiah or he was a maniac who had lost his mind and had claimed to be what he was not. Um, this is why on many occasions we're going to see here in chapter 7 that they would say to him that you have a devil or you're possessed. And oftentimes they said that to Jesus because of the, the pointedness of some of the things that he said. But I want you to understand the debates, they're endless. There are always going to be people debating whom Jesus is. It always has been and always will be until one day. I was talking about it in early service. There's coming a day when every eye will see Jesus for who he is. 
There is coming a day when he will come through the eastern sky. And um, I don't know, I have an imagination when I read the Bible, you know. Uh, the Bible is clear that the sky is going to open up. I think it's going to roll back like a scroll. And, you know, the first heaven is, of course, uh, the sky that we see here. Second heaven, we see only at night, really, or through, microsc- or through telescopes into space is the second heaven. But behind the second heaven is the third heaven where Jesus is, where heaven is. And we're going to see those, the sky open up and, and um, we're going to see Jesus come down. And the Bible records that there's going to be silence. Like you won't hear a bird chirp. And I don't know how long it's going to take. I don't know if it's going to be a slow descend. <laughs> but I imagine it might be. It's a slow descend as he comes down. You know, Hollywood has tried their best to try to <laughs> distract us. And, you know, there's no coincidence of the proliferation of movies, uh, you know, that <laughs> talk about, you know, aliens coming from space and, and, thing, and you know, how uh, there's these wrinkles in, in dimensions and things like this. You know, all of this, I believe, is the enemy's ploy to try to distract people and people to to think that Jesus is something other than who he is when he comes. And I believe that this is why it's so important that we as people, as God's people, are influenced and we stay uh, mainly with our heads in this book so we can know and we can ascertain and we can uh, navigate wisely a lot of the the voices out there. So he's going to come down from heaven and every eye is going to behold him. Every eye is going to see him in his glory. And there will be no, there will be no more debating when, he's, when he steps foot on this earth for a second time. Everyone will know who Jesus is, that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And this is what we ought to be living our lives in anticipation. Anticip, ante, let me say that word, anticipation of. of his return. You see, the disciples in his day thought it would be in their lifetime. I more so think it's going to be in ours, <laughs> the way that things look. We've got to be ready. And this is what, this is why we as a church need to occupy until he comes. We need to be busy about his word. His work. People were debating. There were people on both sides of that thing. But I want you to see that they, none of them would really openly speak about Jesus. They were all undercover. They were all afraid of the Jews. Look at verse 13. However, none of, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. They were afraid of the powers that be, the religious leaders. They did not want to identify with Jesus. They did not want to to uh, either identify themselves as opponents of Jesus. They were on the fence. They were right in the middle. Uh, I mean, they were, they were not on the fence, but they were secret with uh, what they had come to the conclusion of. And so I want you to understand that it's very easy for us in this day to be like these people and be fearful of, other, fearful of man so that we don't boldly speak out for God so that we don't live out our faith. And I'm telling you, the fear of man always causes a snare. I'm telling you, you will get caught in living in the fear of man, and you will be of no consequence when it comes to eternity. Your life will have no uh, ramifications beyond your death. And I'm telling you, the men and women who shook the world in in Jesus' day, And in our day and in times past were men and women who did not fear men and women. I don't fear men and women. I fear the one who can put body and soul in hell. I fear God. And so if you bow before God, you can stand before any man. I'm telling you, you don't have to live in fear. And we should be bold to go out and do what God has called us to do. Man, this is not the time for us to be passive pitiful, (laughs) 
uh, weak Christians. I, I was listening to an excerpt from C.T. Studd um, called Chocolate Men. And if you haven't heard it, I want to encourage you to listen to it. And talk, he talks about how God's men have always been heroes, brave men, mighty men of valor, who, who even though they might have had fears and apprehension, they always, take, they always took risks for the name of Jesus. And I can name many in the Bible, you know them, David, you know, 17 years old, fighting a giant when all of the nation trembled at Goliath. I'm telling you, God's men have always been warriors. Worshippers, but warriors. And where are the warriors today in the church? Where are the men and women of God who have boldness from God? And I'm telling you, boldness from God comes in being in his presence. When you spend time with God, when you are in his presence, presence, you realize uh, that he is the one who's going to sustain you, that he holds your times in his hand. You realize who's in control, and you don't have to fear what man can do unto you. Whatever they may throw at us, we can understand that God is ultimately in control, and that he even holds the, the king's heart in his hand. And this is why people are all riled, riled up about what's going on these days. And yes, I'm a little riled up too, but ultimately I know who is the sovereign God of the universe and who I place my my hope and faith and trust and future and family and finances and health in his hands. It's in his hands and his hands, they never fumbled anything. They never failed. He is the undisputed, undefeated king and champion of all time, my friends. And we've got to believe that. We've got to let that get in us and move us. Jesus often lived within moments of tension. He lived within those who were seeking his life. He, he lived in the shadow of people's disbelief. He lived in the time of people debating him, but he remained faithful, and so should we. So should we. Oh, what a Savior we have. We know that he endured all that. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, even uh, he, that he endured the death of the cross so that he could receive the glory on the other side of that. And I want to tell somebody in here this morning, if you endure, if you're faithful to God, even when people hate you because of it, even if it costs you something, if you are faithful to God on the other side of that, there is rewards. There is glory that out last anything in this life. And this is where we've got to come to the point. You see, what this does, what, what, what John is doing to, uh, in, in, the, in the last few chapters, he's pushing up upon our comfort. He's saying we're, we're too comfortable. We live, there's not enough <laughs> in our lives that is causing us to be in conflict, that is causing us to uh, have to be uncomfortable. And I'm saying this to someone this morning, that it's time for you to not shirk away from the confrontations. It's time for you to stand boldly for God and to live out what he's called you. Some of you, he's called you to do some things that seemingly is impossible and you haven't done it because you're, you're timid and you're afraid. And, and can God sustain me? Can he really do that? And I'm telling you, I'm here this morning to tell you that it's time for you to step out. It's time for you to follow him. It's time for you to count the cost. It's time for us to stand up in this generation that needs to see true biblical Christianity. Or you can just be like the Jews of that day, just stay quiet, stay fearful, get involved in debates. That's what a lot of Christians do because they're not in the battle. We sit around, we have the luxury in America to sit at coffee shops and debate doctrine. <laughs> Christians in China must laugh at us. When coming to church for them may mean they go to a work camp for 10 years, but they still go. And this is what God has really just been impressing on, on 
my heart to just internalize first and share with you is that we've got to we've got to get real with it. We've got to stop playing around. Because there's a war going on. <laughs> and you know, I was listening to T.T. said, talk about the chocolate soldiers, and he said, you know, God's men, God's warriors, when they are not at battle is when they are most susceptible to failure. When they're not, remember David, when kings ought to be at war, he was on his roof. You know what that cost him. And some of us, your marriage isn't right, your kids are out of order, Finances can't ever seem to be right. Other things I can name. And you know what the problem is? We're not in battle. We've got to wake up in America. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Christ. As I mentioned before, life is a vapor. You and I could be gone tomorrow. Today could be our last day. When you stand before God, we'll... Accept you? Will you stand before God re- ready for eternity, or will you be under the judgment of God? And the difference between those two types of people is, is very simple it's a person, Jesus. If you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've received Him by faith, then when you die, you, the next, when you take your last breath of air on this side of eternity, when you awake, you will be in the presence of God. But without Jesus, you will wake up in torment. This is why the church of the living God exists to preach the good news that you don't have to go to hell, but Jesus has provided a way to heaven, and it's a narrow way. It's it's through faith in him and him alone. And this is a day where you can receive that gift. You can come to Jesus this morning Bible, and he said it, I will in no wise cast any who come unto me. If you're a Christian today, you've been a fence sitter, you've been in this world, you've been not in battle, you've you've had a worldly mindset, you've been comfortable here, whatever the Lord speaks to you about today, I want you to do business with God. The altar is going to be open. There will also be men and women in the prayer room who will pray with you if you need prayer. But we've got to get serious about God. Jesus, he lived in the pressure cooker. (laughs) But I've learned this, that anything worth doing, anything that will be be worth it in the end is hard. It's going to cost us something. But it will be worth it. It will be worth it all. There's an old hymn that comes to my mind. It will be worth it all. When we see Jesus, I'm telling you that's the truth.